that many of you love your binge watching, but you have to admit that from a business perspective, it's a mistake to drop this show as a binge. I mean, maybe it'll be another One Piece or Stranger Things, but that is, you know, a very high bar. And I think that being a weekly release would have given this show a bit of a safety net. Uh, I mean, also, maybe it would make it easier because some of you are very against this show. I hope, I hope you've changed your mind when you see how good it is. Uh, but to maybe get a couple of people to, to change their mind and decide to check it out because it's, you know, so popular. I mean, I easily, and I think now that you've seen it, you'll probably agree, you know, easily I could have done 20 to 30 minute breakdowns of each episode. And I wish that I could because they're just so rich and so much, there's so much great stuff to discuss, uh, not only in terms of the episodes themselves, but in comparing to the original animated series. There's just so much to discuss. And it's hard to have that detailed discussion when you have to swallow the whole eight episodes at once. Uh, if this was like on Disney Plus or Prime Video weekly, I think this would have stayed in the conversation for the general public and you know, in, in popular culture for eight weeks for all the episodes. And that would have been two months of discussion and talking about this. And again, maybe it'll be another One Piece or Stranger Things. I even wish it, maybe it was two halves of a season like Netflix has been doing recently to extend the conversation around their shows. But I know a lot of you were upset when I first tweeted that I wish this was a weekly drop, but how do you feel about it now? All right, so I mean, it's, I'm sure it's very satisfying to be able to binge it yourself, but wouldn't you love to be able to discuss it and kind of savor it for a week? Right? I mean, I think there are, some, there are, there are benefits to, to both models, even from a, a viewer perspective. All right, so yes, hello and welcome to my spoiler review for Netflix's Avatar The Last Airbender. So many changes, right? And now that we can talk about the changes, how do you feel about them? I feel, as I said in my non-spoiler review, that they make the story richer and more nuanced, but I can see purists maybe taking issue with them. However, this adaptation is very loyal to the animation in many ways, from characters to even production design. A great example is the hallways of Roku's temple. They didn't need to recreate those, even down to the way that you open the secret doors. Although some of you might be like, they didn't have the way that you open the main door. But I mean, come on. I mean, I thought it was fine, and I thought that was really cool that they had those, those, um, those homages to the animated series. Now, before we dive into the show, the episodes itself, let's take a moment to talk about the end credit scene of sorts, where a fire sage, one of the corrupted ones from Roku's temple, informs Fire Lord Ozai that a comet is approaching. Don't they know it's every hundred years? But maybe, you know, it's give or take. But they're like, hey, I don't know how that doodad worked, but it was cool looking. Uh, and as fans of the original series know, that Sozin's comet which grants the firebenders more power. In fact, in episode one, I don't think they made it clear enough, when the Fire Nation soldier tells Gyatso uh, that at, on any other night, the air nomads would have prevailed in the battle, they would have been able to hold the Fire Nation off, this night they cannot because Sozin's Comet is there, you know, boosting the Fire Nation's power. And they didn't really make that very clear. Uh, also, um, that's how the Fire Nation was able to win in the first place and go to war with all the other uh, king, all the other nations because they had that boost in power. And it passes over every hundred years, which is exactly how long Aang has been gone. So Sozin's Comet levels up firebenders, and we learn that a full moon levels up waterbenders. Oh, advantage waterbenders! There's a lot more full moons than there are comets. Uh, and earthbenders, in case you're wondering, are more powerful when there's an earthquake, uh, although they, of course, can create earthquakes. Maybe it has to be a natural one. And then airbenders, appropriately, their additional power comes from inside, from inner peace, because they're spirituality. Then, uh, speaking of leveling up, another big reveal towards the end of the series is that Azula can bend lightning. And oh, it looks good! And the idea here is that it's another form of fire. Uh, she also is the one, by the way, to take over Omashu and to win it for the Fire Nation, which has got a sting for her uncle Iroh, because he, of course, could not take over Ba Sing Se, another, uh, you know, the biggest Earth Kingdom city. Omashu is the second biggest. Uh, so uh, it probably particularly means a lot for her uh, 
to, to surpass her uncle as she tries to, you know, overtake her father. Now, similarly, late, uh, speaking of you know, other ways that bending can be used, fire to lightning, uh, you'll see that earth bending leads to metal bending. Oh, I love metal bending. Water bending leads to blood bending. Creepy. Uh, meanwhile, advanced airbenders are capable of flight. Not, they don't need a kite. And also spiritual projection. What? They get too. Uh, that's what they get for finding inner peace. Thank you very much. But of course, no one is as powerful as the Avatar, uh, which we see uh, several times throughout the show, uh, Aang in the Avatar state. Uh, boy, love it. Loved it so much. I thought that not only was it cool when uh, Avatar Kyoshi took over Aang's body, but I liked how that set the stage more clearly for the ocean spirit to take him over in the finale. And that it wasn't just a kaiju that he became, but it was very much a giant version of that fish from the pond uh, made out of the waters of the ocean. I mean, I thought that looked incredible. I was like, wow, that looks so good. And speaking of looking good, Aang looked incredible at the heart of that kaiju uh, in the Avatar state. Uh, it was so perfectly well realized. I couldn't believe how good it looked. Not only visually, but I thought that Gordon Cormier carried himself very well as Aang, uh, you know, physically. Not only did he strike just the right pose, uh, and I, you know, sometimes it's a CGI double, but sometimes it's not. But then even in the close-up, that was so great, he was able to be detached but play it that still Aang was deep inside there. I mean, I think that, as I said, Cormier is a little precocious as, as many child actors are, but his range is incredible. It's worth the trade-off in my opinion. I really like him in this role. Uh, some of you pointed out how quickly he's growing up, but that's fine because the story's only going to get more adult. So I think it's okay. I think it's fine. I mean, at this rate, with how long it'll take to make these, he'll be able to do adult Aang pretty soon, which will be great. <laughs> I don't mind. I think it's going to be great. And what is, and speaking of things that are great, what a great surprise to meet not one, but three previous avatars in book one. Roku appeared in book one in the animated series, uh, but here we meet two more avatars. And we also see that they have statues as well. And the new rule that Aang can only communicate with them when he's at their temples, which I think makes sense. I thought it was a good rule. I liked it. And their temples all look so fantastic. Uh, Kyoshi, Kyoshi's appearance was brief but powerful, again, taking over Aang's body to deal with Zhao's forces. And she was effective! But I really loved seeing Kur uh, Kuruk. I thought he looked so great, and I thought he really ca captured the spirituality of that avatar, and the tragedy of that avatar as well. Uh, he did a great job tying the story more to the spiritual elements than it was in the animated series in book one. They even included how his fiance was lost to Ko, the face stealer, and George Takai, who of course voiced a character in the animated series, uh, not, a, not a big one, but he was there, but to have him come back as this character was a great match. And I loved how truly menacing and dangering this monster was. Loved it. Loved it they didn't hold back on that. Also, they included the legend of Umashu in a beautiful sequence, particularly for an all-ages show. And having Katara and Sokka navigate the, navigate the tunnels was new, because in the series, the animated series, they were held captive by King Bumi to motivate Aang. Uh, but I liked this better. I thought this was a better choice. Uh, I thought you had development for Katara and Sokka, and the reveal that this blind spiritual badger mole could only see emotion. And so that's why and I think, you know, it not only saved Katara and Sokka in that moment, but I think it underscores that that's something you should always be thinking about, you know, with the energy that you're radiating. I thought that was great. All right, for the rest of this spoiler review, I'm going to go by Nation. And in order of my favorite, although it's tough, they were all so well realized. And my favorite Nation was... The Fire Nation! I know, I'm as surprised as you. I'm a big Earth Kingdom fan, and I loved, I loved all of them. But Fire Nation was just so well done. I particularly like all the backstory that was added to Zuko and Iroh. Uh, some of it, uh, you know, like a lot of this stuff sometimes is moved up from book two and book three, but some of it's just new, which I think, and I think that it was fan all fantastic additions. Some of my favorite touches were actually getting to see the funeral for Iroh's son and Zuko's kindness to him and how their bond started. I thought, you know, a boy in need of a father and a father in need of a son, a son in need of a father and a father in need of a son. Oh, so poetic. I love it. 
And I also loved the reveal that Zuko's crew discovered that they were the battalion of new recruits that Zuko didn't want his father to sacrifice, which led to Zuko's banishment, and his father decided to make his punishment even more cruel by assigning him that battalion. I think that's new to the series, right? I checked. I couldn't see it, um, you know, in any of the other books. Uh, and I thought that was, speaking of poetic, I thought, mwah, beautiful addition. I'm not sure why Ozai wanted Zuko to fire on him, because o uh, Zuko had such a clear shot of his father that surely Ozai would have been seriously injured if not killed. And I think, you know, the more I think about it, and I think you can see that on Daniel Day Kim's face, I think Zuko frightened him that he had the shot. And I think that's partially why he sent his son away, because he was afraid of being usurped. And at that time, remember, it seemed like an impossible task. The Avatar hadn't been seen for 100 years. So, you know, they're really, at the time, Ozai felt there was no way Zuko would return. Uh, and I think it's to Zuko's credit, and also one of, you know, Zuko, his, his best qualities are his worst qualities. Isn't that interesting? But why on earth would Zuko pay attention to the banishment? I'd be like, oh, you're not the boss of me. I am going to overtake you. Azula. Uh, his sister, of course, is even more ruthless on the show. But I guess she's a ruthlessness, maybe, and a power that Ozai can understand because she's so much like him. Ah, oh, the feels! I love thinking of all this stuff. See, if only we could go over these episodes uh, one by one. Uh, but, you know, she's even more ruthless here. In fact, she's introduced infiltrating a group of resistance fighters and leading them into a trap where they think they're going to assassinate Ozai. But in fact, she watches as her father burns them alive. What did you think of the change of having the Fire Nation actually killing people and sometimes it being very heavily alluded to, if not some a bit shown on screen? I like it. I think it makes sense. I mean, what else is going to happen when you engulf people in flames? And I, 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 although I do think that if they were going to heighten that realism, I think that Zuko's scar should have been made to look a little bit more gruesome. I know that there, we, have, we have to look at it so much, but, uh, I mean, it seemed very cosmetic to me. I think, I guess those are some amazing healing herbs they came up with, right? But I think it should have just been a little bit more to even more show his pain and also his shame. Uh, again, he's so poetic. All right. And Zhao, so well realized here. I think Lung does an even better job than the animated version of the character. And speaking of poetic, I love this. In some ways, when you think about it, Zhao is a warped reflection of Zuko, who's also been in a way banished, trying to claw his way back to the top. But Zhao has no honor or compassion, and that's why Zuko is his better. And this underscores why those qualities are important for Zuko to hold on to, or else he'd be Zhao. And I think that's great. I love that. And wow, Zhao met a much more violent end here. Instead of being killed or swept away by, an ocean, by the ocean spirit, Iroh takes him out, as Zuko once more shows maybe a bit too much compassion. I love you, Zuko, but when are you going to start learning from your mistakes? I'm not saying he should have killed Zhao, but he should have made sure he was incapacitated. Stop turning your back on your enemy, man! At least back away! I also really loved Zuko as the blue spirit freeing Aang from Zhao's clutches. They did a great job recreating that action sequence from the animated series, one of the best ones. And it's so great to see younger characters depicted as skilled fighters rather than comedically benefiting from dumb luck as Hollywood has so often done. All right, next up, runner up, is it the Earth Kingdom? No, it's the Air Nomads. I know, I know. I can't wait to hear your rankings down below. Lots of big changes here as well, particularly moving up Aang's backstory to episode one, shocking right out of the gate and very moving. I thought the siege on the Southern Air Temple was extremely well done, so powerful, so disturbing, as it should be. And I was impressed that they went there. And when Aang remembers Gyatso at the end of episode one, that moved me to tears. That was just beautiful. So well done. That actor also, want to give a huge shout out to him, loved him. I also loved the great focus on the spirituality of the air nomads and that to me more than ever, Aang really did come across as a young monk. He clearly wasn't, well, I wouldn't say he was an excellent student. He even himself admits to goofing off because he's so naturally gifted, but he seems to be not only naturally gifted in airbending, but also spirituality. Although of course that's partially, probably what, what makes him such an, a skilled airbender, because those two things are combined. But how he so often would bring up the teachings of the air nomads, I thought was really beautiful and made, so, made for so many great lessons for viewers. The air, that airbending is all about resolving conflict rather than creating it, 
or, ex or, or extending it, I thought was also very beautiful and moving. And I thought Aang's airbending moves, by the way, looked fantastic. Ah, oh, so well realized, even down to the use of his kite. Uh, only a little towards the end did I start to see that they were using clearly a CGI double. I was like, he's moving around like Gumby, man. But it still looked cool, so I didn't mind. But yeah, really well realized. All right, now is it the Earth Kingdom's time? I'm afraid not. I'd have to go next with the Water Tribe. Don't worry, I love them all. But I really was impressed with the Water Tribe as well. The first thing that I want to highlight about them is the casting. We've seen a number of Native American projects lately, which is fantastic. But it's great to see that focus in Hollywood. But I feel, in my opinion, that none of them have captured the epic scope of the Native American people like this show. So, much, so many strong, warm, majestic personalities. I mean, it was incredible. And I liked that instead of Katara stealing the waterbending scroll from pirates as she did in the animated series, that here her grandmother passes it on to her, slipping it into their belongings as they go on, a, on an adventure with Aang because her grandmother felt it was finally safe for Katara to pursue her abilities. I really particularly, I mean, the whole, everybody in the Water Tribe was so well cast, but I thought that Katara and Sokka's mother and grandmother, really in particular, radiated just so, so much charisma and uh, just fantastic. I love them. Uh, like that one shot where Katara's mother turns around, I was like, no wonder her water bending got so much better. That is a powerful image. So there are a couple of reasons, a couple other reasons that the Water Tribe was able to edge out the Earth Kingdom on my list. Uh, and again, remember, Earth Kingdom is my, has been my favorite. So one reason is how great water bending looks here, particularly when they get to the Northern Water Tribe. When Katara challenges Master Paku, so many great moves. They even had, and a lot of them were ripped right from the animated series, which was great. It's thrilling to watch, not only because it reminded me of the animated series fight, but it just looked so good and was so well done. And by the way, my favorite move of hers, I can now reveal it, is the disc move that she learns from the earthbenders. That is the mark of a great master, as they say here, that she can create her own moves. And I thought that was so clever and it looked incredible, the way she would just, you know, I love bringing up a column and then rapid firing discs with earth or ice. I mean, it was just great. There's so many great moves to come for all these bending skills. And it is very, very exciting. Uh, and then when they had the battle against the Fire Nation, that sequence looked incredible from the Fire Nation's uh, ships and, you know, the, 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 um, the, the catapults. That was great to how the, uh, the waterbenders were using their abilities to fight on their side. I mean, that was just so, so, so well realized. Movie level, in my opinion. Also, the Northern Water Tribe as a location was so well realized and not only captured the magic of the animated version, but I feel increased it, stunningly brought to life. I was like, it looks so good. Then of course, Princess Yu. I did not care for Amber Midthunder's costume. That wig is a crime against humanity. I can't believe they looked at it while they were filming and weren't like, we have to be able to do better than that. But. Thankfully, Amber Midthunder had a wonderful performance. I thought she was great. And I, although I thought here, it seemed like Sokka was moving through girlfriends perhaps a little bit more quickly than he should, right? I was like, didn't we just have a good time with Suki? What the heck, man? Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, Sokka seems so innocent here. You know, he didn't make any promises to anybody. Uh, but uh, speaking of Princess Yu, back to her, I would have preferred to see her actually become the moon spirit as she does in the animated series, but this is a more serious show, the live action version. And I think that would have undercut her sacrifice because I think it would have seemed like she still pretty much existed as is. She's now just glowy. But instead, I suspect she's back in the spirit world uh, as that fox. And I thought that was a great thing that, you know, is that from the other books? I only watched book one. Maybe I should have watched all the books to prepare because I didn't know they were going to fold them into each other like this. But, you know, I wanted to, you know, only have that as my reference, you know, recent reference point. I mean, I've seen all the episodes in The Legend of Korra, etc. But uh, I liked, I liked her being that fox, uh, the three-tailed fox. She looked like a Pokemon. I loved it. All right, finally, the Earth Kingdom. Omashu did look fantastic and actually at times reminded me a bit of an Indiana Jones movie. Uh, I like the color scheme that was so prevalent for all the different kingdoms. That worked really, really well for me. Uh, but it, it's still, uh, I, I, but it wasn't simplistic. The production design here was so ornate and detailed. I just loved it. So much to explore. Uh, but the only thing I would have preferred would be to spend more time in Umashu. I don't think we got to see enough of the city. Uh, and also another 
complaint is that the sequence where they use the earth bending delivery system, those chutes to travel, um, isn't nearly as good as it was in the animated series. And I didn't like that it wasn't Aang's idea. I thought they took a, that was like one of the only things that I didn't think was tr well translated. I think the reason that Umashu lost a little of its focus is that they folded Jet and Teo's storylines into Umashu. Uh, but th those storylines were so good, and I'm so glad they kept them that I guess, you know, it's okay. It's fine. Uh, and of course, we'll talk about King Bumi in a moment, who is incredible. And, uh, uh, you know, that is still great. All right, so Sebastian Amoruso made an amazing jet. Charismatic. As soon as we met him when we were going into the city, I was like, who's this guy? Uh, and they still got across that he was willing to sacrifice innocent lives to defeat the Fire Nation. But something I really liked that they added was his conversation with Katara about remembering how lost, remembering um, lost loved ones, how they lived rather than how they died was a better way to go to move forward. And I thought that again was uh, not only was it a great way to open up Katara's bending skills, but I thought it was a really beautiful sentiment for the viewing audience to, to hear. Uh, side note, by the way, Katara, while in the spirit world, remembers her mother's sacrifice for her. Uh, you know, that she, you know, her mother says, you know, pretends that she's the waterbender that the, the Fire Nation is searching for so that her daughter can live. Uh, but that, that was actually revealed in the animated series later on, not in book one. But I think considering how they went over the origin stories of Aang and Zuko in so much depth, I think it made sense to try and balance things out a little bit by at least getting a glimpse of Katara and Sokka's origin stories to a degree as well. Sokka remembers overhearing his father confiding to others that Sokka would not make a good warrior because he didn't do a good, do a good job on their test. And they showed that test in book one. And I have to say, I thought it was interesting because in book one, when I saw it in the animated series, I said to myself, I think Sokka did a horrible job there. <laughs> but they never really said that. You know, instead they were just like, oh, he's a great leader who assembled a great team and everybody was able to help and that was important. Uh, I would say that that's, that's interesting about Sokka. I don't think he's a great warrior. I think he is more of a leader, which is interesting uh, to make that distinction because, and he was showing some good moves at the end there when they were taking out that Fire Nation ship at the big battle at the end. I was like, ah, oh, Sokka's starting to, you know, again, as I said, make some moves. He was, I thought, very commanding. But he's not a great fighter. I think, you know, he's, he can hold his own. You know, we don't have to worry about him too much. But his skills are a leader or an engineer. I loved when the mechanists told Sokka that you're lucky if you discover what you're good at in life. And, you know, you shouldn't be ashamed of it if it's not the cool thing that you were maybe hoping for. Because you should pursue that ability. And great things can come from it. Uh, like engineering, you know, and I loved, you know, that they included that air balloon and, you know, they changed it that, uh, that Zhao used the air balloon, uh, which I thought all worked for me. These changes all worked for me. And I love the line when, you know, Sokka was like, I, I recognize that and I know that it hasn't been fitted for warfare because I helped create it. I really loved Danny Pudi and uh, Lucian River uh, Kohan uh, in their roles as the Mechanist and Teo. I thought they really leapt off the screen. Very vibrant personalities and great looks. And then of course, King Boomy. Ah, I was wondering who was under all that makeup and it's comedian Utkarsh Umbudkar who I think does a fantastic job. He did a really nice job. I usually do not care for his work, but I liked him here. And I thought one of the best things was his speech to Aang about the game of being an adult during war and the horrible choices that one is forced to make. I loved that. That was such a great new addition. I just thought that was one of my favorite things. Uh, like, you know, who gets the food, the orphanage or your army? I mean, that was just so good. Also, two friends separated by 100 years. To me, that came across much more powerfully here because they added a tragic element to it. Like in the animated series, Boomy was like, yay, we get to still play together. But I love the line when King Boomy says, how am I an adult and you're still a child? And he says that, you know, like, you better, an I, I demand an answer. You know, it was great. And I had like, it reminded me a little bit of the Peter Pan stories where Peter comes back and visits a grown up Wendy. I thought, just thought that was great. Earthbending looks cool here as well, but I mean, I've seen much better earthbending in the animated series. You ain't seen nothing yet about what earthbending can do. Uh, that's why I'm hopeful that we get more live action adaptations because I'd really love to see Toph in this uh, telling. So what do you think of the live action adaptation of Avatar The Last Airbender? Do you want more? Uh, what do you think of the ch what they changed and what they added? 
Uh, and what are, which of the four nations are your favorite? And again, be sure to share your rankings down below. Thank you for going over this show with me. And oh, by the way, I'd also be curious what you think about binge versus weekly now that you've seen the show. All right, share your thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.